us that she would. Yeah. Tell us what, what can it be? Because it sees us speaking to her. Camera there, camera there.
Um, that should be fine, but if, if obviously, but as an actual break around, then that that um, that should be good. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Solidi. I move now to my next main heading, which is the law. Yes. Um, there are some differences between us about the law, maybe narrow, but perhaps important. Yes. Um, what I propose to do on the law is um, make some submissions about four of the key cases in chronological order, and uh, then also uh, about some of what the judge said and why we are not happy with the law. Quite Fine. Um, so I'm going to start, if I may, with Lang and Taylor Walton in Authorities Bundle 2 at Tab 14. You may have a chance to look at this in pre reading. Um, just to remind you, this is the case where the claimant lost to the first trial on the question what his agreement with the uh, counterparty was. I'm so sorry, I haven't yet found the right tab. Uh, Which is two? Yes. Yep. Tab 14. 14. 14. I thought you said 15. Oh. It sounds like I may have said the wrong thing. Anyway. I think you may have said 15, which is why I was looking at all these stores, but don't worry. <laughs> yes. Well, we don't want to look at all these stores. <laughs> yes, sorry. Far too, Lang and Taylor, yeah. Far yeah. too complicated. With you. <laughs> no, I prefer Lang and Taylor Walter. A, a, a nice simple case where um, the, the claimant <laughs> had a dispute about what agreement he'd reached with the Yes. Yeah. Lost. Yep. And then sought to sue his solicitor for failing to draft the agreement in the terms that he thought he ought to have said. And uh, the Court of Appeal, overturning the judge, held that this was an abusive process because the solicitor couldn't be at fault unless the original agreement had been what the first judge held it was not. Uh, the main judgment is given by Lord Justice Buxton. At page 307 of the report, you see paragraph 11 with a quote from Lord Dicklock in Hunter. Yes. And the end of that quote is the source of the, I don't know if it's the original source, but it's certainly a source of the uh, duty comment that uh, struck yes. me out as the duty. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, paragraph 13 is one of the, um, the end of that paragraph is one of the places where you find authority for the proposition that the Court of Appeal will give weight to the opinion of the judge, the end of paragraph 13. And then <coughs> we move on to paragraph 20 on page 309. You can see that one of the things that the claimant's advocate did was show the court that there were real arguments that the decision of the first court was wrong. And that's that would be the equivalent if my learned friend had attempted to show your lordships that the provisions actually should have been higher, or well, the disclosures should have been more wide ranging. And then at paragraph twenty, uh, there, and, then, and then the court says there, are, Lord Justice Buxton says there are two types of difficulty yes. about this approach, and the the most important one is at twenty two. The second, different and more significant difficulty, is however that everything said to us and to Mr Justice Langley in criticism of His Honour Judge Thornton's judgment could have been said to His Honour Judge Thornton and mainly was so said it could have been deployed on appeal from His Honour Judge Thornton that was never brought what is sought to be achieved in the second claim is therefore not the addition of which negligently or for whatever other reason was not omitted from the first case but rather relitigation of the first case on the basis of exactly the same yeah. material it was or could have been before His Honour Judge Thornton um, my Lord, I just draw attention to the way Lord Justice Buxton puts that. It's matters that were mainly said, matters that could have been before him. The, 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 the question of whether this is relitigation is viewed as a matter of substance. It's, it's not viewed as a, um, a sort of a, a, a tick list of every tiny little point. Um, it's looked at in substance. Then at the next page, 25, Lord Justice Buxton deals with the argument that it makes all the difference that the defendant in the new claim is different and refers in that context uh, to my note says refers to Hall and Silence, but I think that must be later. Um, I mean, yes, in the next paragraph. Yes, in the next paragraph. Yeah. Sorry, it then refers to, to Hall and Simon. Um, and uh, I 
also draw attention to what's said at, 20, at the end of 25, that uh, where exceptionally a collateral first instance action can be brought, it has to be based on new evidence that must be such as entirely changes the aspect of the case, phosphate sewage. Um, and uh, the claim in their case fell short of that. And then he does refer to Hall and Simons and a paragraph 27. I now remember, Mr. Salzig, I also remember because I've looked at all these cases, most of these cases, um, about three weeks ago in another appeal. But was phosphate sewage, I know I, re I recall it being cited to the court in which I gave the judgment in Kamoka, um, but was it cited to, to the House of Lords in Hunter? I don't know. I'm sorry. Because, it, I, mean, it, 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 I mean, you do rely on phosphate sewage in this context, or at least the principle derived from phosphate sewage. Uh, yes. So one of the exceptions to what you say would otherwise be an abuse is if, if the claimants here were coming forward and saying, well, since the hearing before um, Mr Justice Rose, the following 42 new facts have emerged, which make all the difference. Yes, exactly. And, I, and, and <coughs> while being very clear that I'm not asking your lordships to impose any um, straitjacket on the test, uh, it's not actually that far from Ladin Marshall. If you've got what's otherwise obviously a, a, a relitigation, you need to show that the reason you're doing it is that something new has emerged which is yeah. important and which you didn't have before. Phosphate yeah. sewage was referred to by Lord Diplock according to the report of Hunter at Stamp 4. Right, I mean, yes. Junior's just pointed that out to you. Probably, oh, we're probably yes, all getting yes, out at yes, the same yes. time. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Singler uh, also, also found that by Lord. Yeah. So yes, that's right. <laughs> um, just uh, testing. <laughs> So you're going to refer to paragraph 26? Uh, yes, yeah, so it, it's simply the fact that so Hall and Simons was cited, and at paragraph 27, Lord Justice Buxton says, of course I agree it will not necessarily be a valid objection to a claim of solicitor's negligence about litigation, that the claim asserts matters different from those decided. Um, and, and there are circumstances in which that might arise. The solicitors have made administrative errors, um, which might have stopped, a, you know, for example, a time limit, it's an obvious point. Errors in assembling the evidence led to an incorrect result, as in Hall and Simons. But the present case is significantly different from those just mentioned. The difference is that, as shown in paragraph 19, in order to succeed on the new claim, Mr. Lang has to demonstrate not only that the decision of His Honour Judge Thornton was wrong, but also that it was wrong because it wrongly assessed the very matters that are assessed on in support of the new claim. That's an abusive relitigation of His Honour Judge Thornton's decision, not by appeal, but in collateral proceedings, and his substance, if not strictly form falls foul of the phosphate sewage rule. And, and of course we say that that has a, that, that, that is very similar to the position in our case, um, as I suggest it should be analysed. Paragraphs 28 and 29 say that Mr Lang sought to escape from this dilemma by arguing that his complaint was not that Mr Kelly's drafting had produced the error on the part of the judgment but rather that without the error the case would never have reached his honour judge Thornton because if the documentation had been correctly drawn Mr Watson would have recognised it represented what had been agreed and would have signed it. And of course this is not dissimilar from the argument that if only the auditors had done something different then the directors would have made a different provision. The difficulty about that approach in paragraph 29 is that it requires to be rejected um, in that case another finding that the parties had indeed entered into Mr Watson's first agreement. And of course in our case the parallel is that, that it requires to be rejected that the, the findings that the directors had in fact made that, those provisions on the basis that they made them, which was a proper basis. There's, there is no basis on which, so rather like the solicitor can't be expected to draft an agreement that hasn't been made, an auditor can't be expected to reject a provision which is proper. So there's the same we say that, I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, one can go too far in saying, well, there's an exact parallel between the facts. But my point is that the logical structure and the relationship between the claims is extremely similar and, it, and is relevant to the abuse question. And my Lord, finally, paragraph 33, um, <coughs> Lord Justice Buxton held the proceedings were abuse. And the problem that he found with the judgment of Mr. Justice Langley below was that he had not given sufficient weight to the central factor against that abuse, 
that the proceedings are in substance a complete relitigation of the decision of His Honour Judge Thornton. And of course, I would say that that is exactly what we have here. In substance, it's a complete relitigation. Um, and I draw attention to three specific points in common, which are related to each other. The first is that at the first trial, the relevant issue was decided between the most appropriate parties for that issue. So Lang and Taylor Walton, the relevant issue was what was agreement actually made, and that was decided between the contracting parties. Here, the relevant issue is whether the provisions were adequate ones under company law and accounting standards, and that was determined between the company acting by an assignment and the interests of its known creditor, all the directors, and the only shareholder. And they were the proper parties to that particular issue. Um, the second point, similarly in the structure, is that the key common issues were decided in the first case, at least in part, on the basis of the oral evidence of witnesses. Guarantee or even likelihood that the same witnesses will be available in the second trial. Um, it's, not a, it's not a massive part of the reasoning of Langton and Walton, but it, it is there. I'm not sure I've shown it to you, but uh, it is mentioned, um, in particular in the second judgment. Um, and the third issue, the third the third point is that the, the key issue determined in the first trial is logically upstream of the key issue for determination in the second trial. And uh, I, I think I've made that submission. I think I need to... Sorry, repeat that again. The, um, the, 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 the main issue that was determined in the first trial is logically upstream of the main yeah. issue to be determined in the second trial. The upstream, downstream. And, and we were debating that just before that. Mm. Um, and if you, point, if you put those points together, you have a situation where, uh, in relation to 2015, that there may be sense in hearing the two claims consecutively. It's, it's, it's not the ideal, but it can happen. It, it, it's not necessarily a disaster. If the claimant wins the first case, then they may make full recovery. They may not. If they don't, they can go on and have a go at the second defence. If they lose the first case, then it should be obvious that the second won't get off the ground. The procedural dissonance occurs only if the claimant loses the first case, but then mounts a collateral attack on it by pursuing the second. That, that's the situation that the Court of Appeal in Lang and Taylor Walton refused to contemplate, and we say that this court should have the same reaction to it. Now, my lords, I, I do put some weight on this case as being really very, very similar, um, and therefore my learned friends have dealt with it in detail in their skeleton argument by raising six points. So I'm, I'm going to go yeah. through them. There are, in my learned friend's skeleton argument... Lord Justice Moses actually puts his finger, doesn't he, in paragraph 37 of his judgment on, on the point that in most solicitors' negligence cases, you're not impugning... You have a, a trial and you lose, you then sue your solicitor for negligence. In the second case, normally you're not impugning the, the judgment. What you're saying is, had it not been for your negligence, the the first case would have gone completely differently, yes. which is not the same thing as a collateral attack. Mm. No, and, right. and he makes the point that the difference in the present case is that he couldn't establish that the solicitor's drafting the agreement was negligent without challenging the judge's finding as to, as to um, the binding nature of the agreement. Yes, exactly. That's right. And I, I do say that the, the, the logical <coughs> structure of that is... Yeah, sorry, that's a good right. idea. So, um, my, I was going to... My, my learned friends, in this skeleton argument of paragraph 50, um, I don't know if your lordships have that in the bundle. It's at number one, tab four. Um, they have six objections to our reliance on lag. First, they say that lag does not. It is not suggested that lag stands for different principles to Michael Wilson. That's true. Putting the point the other way round, no one suggests that Michael, that, in, that the result of Michael Wilson is that Lang is not the right principle. Now that's important because Lang is the one that's most similar on the facts in our case, and because understanding that may actually help in, a, in construing what's said in Arthur Wilson, in Michael Wilson. Um, in this subparagraph, I should say that my learned friends are wrong to say that Arthur Hall case was not cited in Lang. Yeah. Um, secondly, they say analogies are of limited value, and I accept that point as far as it goes. We 
each case in this field is decided on its facts, uh, but it's hardly a powerful ground of distinction. Third, they say Lang was different. They say, um, so if we look at their reasons for saying Lang was different, uh, in my submission, there's really nothing in the first three. They say Lang was concerned with a, a simple issue. I mean, I, I agree that our case is more complex, my lords, but I hope I've explained it has the same logical structure. Uh, that issue was fundamental in the second claim. That's certainly true in our case. And uh, it turned on the credibility of only two witnesses of fact. I mean, in our case, Mr. Martinet is undoubtedly the, the witness of fact whose credibility really mattered. Uh, while there were other witnesses of fact, none of whom are likely to be available in the PwC claim, um, that, that doesn't seem to prove my level of credibility. <coughs> well, although I, I reject out of hand in my submission the first. Well, it didn't, doesn't make any three. sense either, does it? Because the truth is, if it depended on six witnesses of fact whose credibility the judge has accepted the first time round, that might, one might have thought, if anything, that makes it even more difficult. The launch of collateral <laughs> Exactly. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't really assist my own friend's point. Um, then, uh, then they've got um, the, yeah, the evidence was going to be exactly the same. Well, there's perhaps an issue between us about what the evidence is going to be exactly the same, but there's what, what is completely missing is any, um, any evidence or assertion as to what the evidence is in our case that's going to be it's going to make a difference to the outcome. And it's one thing to say, well, if we sue PwC, we can expect PwC to turn up and give evidence. Well, maybe you can, but what are they going to say? And that's, that's what's missing. Um, uh, and fifth, the second claim was issued later. Uh, well, my lord, yes, I submit that's no real relevance. <coughs> and sixthly, they say that there'd be no attempt to join the defendant in the second proceeding. And my lords, I accept that. That, that, is a, that, is a, that is a point of distinction. It is a relevant matter. The, the attempt in 2015 to uh, get a joint trial going is a relevant matter. This, in this case, I say that the attempt was half-hearted. And it's not such, in the end, to make a decisive difference to the, to the position of the claimant. I mean, it, you know, it might be, in a case where the claimant pursues their application for joinder, and the judge says, well, I can see that this might cause a problem, but we're going to go ahead anyway, then it might be. But I've, I've made my submissions about what one can and can't infer from 2015. Um, but I accept that that is a, it's a, it's a, a coin, if you like, in the scale on, on my learning friend's side. But um, you, your submission is that the procedural history and any comparison with Lang can't be determinative. Yes, it, it certainly is not determinative. There may, may be a scale. point of difference, but you, 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 you the, the fact that BTI originally envisaged claims, simultaneous claims, or at one point envisaged simultaneous claims against both, can't of itself mean that it's not a collateral attack. No, not, I mean, none of these points, I mean, the, the authorities are constantly telling us not to, uh, not to try and do this by iron rules, so that's absolutely right. They certainly, it can't be uh, finally determinative. But obviously I go a little bit further than that, and I say not only should you not treat it as finally determinative, but in the particular circumstances of this case, the attempt at joinder was half-hearted, it wasn't pursued, and it, and it wasn't my client's fault that it, was, um, that it wasn't pursued. We, you know, we, we did accept that there was overlap, and uh, it's unfortunate the way it turned out. But if one tries to ask the question, what could have been the sort of objective intention or understanding in 2015, <coughs> uh, it, it really couldn't have been that, that this would be the situation. So... Um, the fourth reason they give at letter D is they say that Michael Wilson fell on the other side of the line, which he did, and that if PwC's argument based on Lang were correct, Michael Wilson would have been decided differently. I mean, well, that's wrong, and I'll, but I'll, if, I, if I may, I'll make that submission as I deal with Michael Wilson rather than now. Um, but I say that's wrong. Fifth, they uh, give some explanations, I think, of the point the points at C, further explanation in relation to 1 to 3. Again, point 1, more complex, true, but not helping the claimants. <coughs> um, different information, they say, would have been obtained. So number 2, they say different information would have been obtained if PwC had acted differently. And this has two problems. One, it overlooks the fact that PwC were auditing the director's provisions. They were not 
advising them on what to do or providing information generally, and secondly, no particular information has been identified. And that's really what's needed at this stage. And thirdly, the third point they make is, as they say, no issues of credibility arise in our case. My Lord, <coughs> that, is, that is plain wrong. I hope I've shown you that in order to undermine the provisions, it is completely essential that they say that Mr Martinet's evidence that he was uh, proceeding both in good faith and in relation to the sophisticated analysis which was put forward um, is overturned. So that, I, that, is, that is completely wrong and indeed it, it is a, it's a significant point against them. And then at letter F, the sixth point is an important one. And they say, they say this, they say the most appropriate parties to a claim that PwC is liable in negligence are PwC and BTI. My lords, that's not the right question. The right question is, who are the most important parties to the determination of the common issues? Not the claim. It's always the case in the second claim that the defendant is the most appropriate party to that claim. The issues here are the propriety of the provision the accuracy of the accounts and the legality of the dividend. And those are issues to which the most appropriate parties were all party to the first claim. Um, and PwC is a side player to that. So my Lord, it, it's, in my submission, it is actually a little bit telling that my learned friends have to put that issue, that, that question in the wrong way to get the answer they, they need. The second authority I want to go to. I'm glad to say the others are not subject to quite such a detailed um, uh, set of submissions from my own friends. The, the next authority I want to go to is Arts and Antiques, which is at uh, tab 16 of the authorities too. And it's a decision of Mr Justice Hamblin, who should, I would, the claimant was a jeweller who'd suffered a burglary their insurance claim failed in arbitration on the basis that a condition called CP2 was part of the policy and had not been complied with. And the claimant now brought proceedings against their brokers, making two main claims. First, that CP2 had not in truth been incorporated in the policy, and the brokers had fabricated a copy of the policy <coughs> containing it. And secondly, if CP2 was incorporated, then the brokers had failed to explain it properly to the insured. Um, the claimant, just, just in order to follow the judgment, the claimant also joined the insurers, claiming that the brokers had been the insurer's agent. Both defendants sought to strike out this claim. The interest for present purposes is in the broker's part of it, which starts at page 244. Paragraph 43. And Sorry, uh, uh, give me that reference again. I just... Page, yes. The claim against the insurers was inevitably going to be struck yes, out. Yes, so that was it? also struck out. Um, right. that, that, even I can follow that. Um, sorry, what was the paragraph you were giving me? Uh, page 244. And can, I, can I just invite my lawyer? No, hang on a moment. The, the, claim, uh, <coughs> the claim in the proceedings was a claim against the Towergate, the brokers, and Mr. Richards, who was their employee. That's right. That's a relevant part of it, yes. So, so, but the, there was another claim against the insurers. There was, yeah. The insurers were also joined, and they, were, and they also succeeded in and they dismissed on the, understandably on the grounds of issue and stuff. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, but I, it's the broker's bit that we're interested in. Yeah. And could I just invite your lordships to read paragraphs 43 to 47?
Mr Justice Hamlin accepted the analogy with Taylor Walton, refused to commit the collateral attack. The underlying issue had been determined between the appropriate parties to that issue. Um, and the relief granted at paragraph 47 was to strike out causes of action that were inconsistent with the result of the arbitration, including the um, forgery allegation, which I think I'm right in saying was, was not part of the arbitration. Um, but, it can't, but the point being made by Mr Justice Hamblin was that if the contract didn't contain CP2, then those allegations would take the claimant nowhere. And, th and there is, of course, a, a, an analogy with our case there, where it's said, well, some of these allegations, like the 2007 accounts, um, were, have not been dealt with. But they take the claimant nowhere if the, if the uh, relevant accounts were correctly drawn. So the thing that did survive, quite rightly, it seems to me, was the claim that to the extent that the policy contained the clause, which it did, because that had been found by the arbitrator, then the, the allegation about bad advice. Yes, exactly. And that's so, a, so yeah, that, it, that, that survived. That wasn't, seems to me, on the face of it, that wasn't capable of being struck out as an abuse clause. Yeah. Mm. That, was the, that was the Hall and Simon's point. Yes, exactly. Exactly. So that's the Hall and Simon's kind of point. And yeah. I mean, in some ways, it could be said that you know, perhaps a key debate between us is whether what's being alleged here against the auditor is a sort of on the Hall and Simon side. <coughs> uh, or on the, the Lang and Arsenault and yeah. Antiques side. Mm. I, I say the answer is very clear. I mean, there is no, there is no, you know, there's no advisory engagement alleged. There was some advice, but no one complains about that. That was done competently. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the, mm. the allegation that did survive, there's paragraph 23.2 that the skeleton argument which is set out by the judge in paragraph 14. <coughs> it's exactly the same sort of allegation as in the context of solicitor's negligence. Yeah. If you'd done your job properly, I wouldn't have been faced with this. Wouldn't have made the claim which I lost yeah. at immense cost. Yes, exactly. <coughs> um, and, and then in the alternative, the judge granted summary judgment at paragraph 48 and 54. Uh, and we say that really that's, a, that's the right approach. So, in other words, we say that this case confirms that the Lang and Taylor Walton represents a particular species of abusive collateral attack. Now, my other friends deal with this case very briefly in their skeleton argument of paragraph 54, and they say that this case relied on Michael Wilson at first instance that was then reversed. And, uh, and there's a, there seems to be an implication there that, uh, that the authority of this is weakened because it was between the two decisions in Michael Wilson. My lords, if, if we look in Arts and Antiques at page 241, Paragraph 23, we see the reference to Michael Wilson and to the decision of Mr. Justice Tier in that case. And the reference is to a particular paragraph about arbitration. Now, my lords, I need you to read this paragraph uh, in any event, so maybe, maybe we should do it now on first sight of it. Um, that part of the reasoning of Mr Justice Tier um, withstood the reversal in the Court of Appeal, because the Court of Appeal decided that um, you could have an abusive process where the first decision was the decision of an arbitral tribunal. They simply differed from the judge on whether, in, on the facts of that case, it was an abuse. Your, your, lord, your, lord, your Lordship is taking advantage of having looked at this very recently, and is, <laughs> is anticipating my submission, which I will make. Not as elegantly, but I will make it. Um, and uh, the, only, the, only, the only use made of Michael Wilson here is, is that paragraph about <coughs> the relevance of the fact the previous claim is in arbitration, yep. and the next paragraph where Mr Justice Hamlin records that in the circumstances of that case, Mr Justice Tier decided it would be an abuse to allow a collateral attack, even though the court proceedings were brought against the non-party to arbitration. 
arbitration. That, that's as far as his reliance on Michael Wilson goes. Um, and uh, if we then turn to Michael Wilson in the next tab, Wilson is a case with reasonably complicated underlying facts. Um, I'll, I'll come back to the underlying facts in a moment. But for the time being, what your Lordship needs to know is that the claimant MWP had failed to establish certain allegations in an arbitration against Mr. Emmett. Mr. Sinclair had been sort of assisting Mr. Emmett's defence but refused to join the arbitration. And MWP then sought to make <coughs> the same allegations against Mr. Sinclair in the High Court, having lost. Mm before the arbitrators on those arbitra on those allegations. Mr Justice Tier struck the claim out as an abuse. The Court of Appeal restored it, and the judgment was given by Lord Justice Simon with the agreement of Lord Justices Ryder and Patton. And if we go to page 2653, a page that uh, paragraphs 37 and 38, you can see there that there were two main issues for the Court of Appeal. The, um, so, sorry, what you, what you see at 38 is that it's necessary to consider uh, this part of the judgment in more detail later, but at this point, sorry, it's convenient to summarise the law under two headings. That's the point I was going to make. Uh, the law under two headings, first, abuse of process, second, reliance by a party advancing an argument on abuse of process on a prior arbitration. So those are the two issues. And then Lord Justice Simon uh, starts on abuse of process and refers to the leading cases on abuse of process. Uh, I don't need to go through that in any detail. And um, uh, note that at paragraph 46, starting on the bottom of 2656, Lang and Taylor Walton is one of the cases considered. Um, and then we get at the bottom of page 2657 to a summary of what he calls the themes that emerge from the cases, which are the, the, the six. And these six um, themes, which both of us accept are authoritative. The first theme is that it sets out the two interests protected by abuse. There's the, um, in, in our case, as you know, I rely only on the public interest. Second theme confirms that relitigation may be abusive, but it's not necessarily so. Third theme summarizes the requirement to engage in a close merits-based analysis of the facts. All very easy for a palais court to state, not so easy for um, the rest of us to apply, but that's what's required. Uh, the fourth theme is <coughs> that uh, it is one where I think I, I, this is important to the issue that may divide us slightly. In carrying out this analysis, we necessarily have, have in mind that A, the fact that the parties may not have been the same in the two proceedings is not dispositive, since the circumstances may be such as to bring the case within the spirit of the rules, as in Arthur Hall. So it may be an abuse um, where parties in the later proceedings were neither parties or privies in earlier proceedings, if it would be manifestly unfair, or if there's an element of vexation in the use of litigation for an improper, improper purpose. Um, and I rely on the fact that in the statement of general principles, it is stated uh, expressly and clearly that the fact parties are not the same is not dispositive. We'll come back to that in a moment. Prince, the, the, the fifth theme is a point on which my learned friends rely, that it will be a rare case where litigation of an issue that has not previously been decided between the same parties will amount to an abuse um, from Reed Norris. And of course, that's right. I obviously accept that. And what I say is that the, the, the situation that's arisen in Taylor Walton and Arts and Antiques and here is a rare situation. Claimants do not normally fight out a full trial, lose, and then try and run the same points against somebody else. It is, it is a rare thing, and it, um, and it, it clearly falls within theme five. Uh, and then 
theme six uh, proves the appellate test from Langton. <coughs> now, immediately after this paragraph, Lord Justice Simon moves to his second law subheading, the application of abuse of process to arbitral awards. Right. And, and this is important for construing what is said later. Paragraph 50 sets out what he, what's later called Mr. S what's called here Mr. Samick's broad submission. The broad submission is that a prior arbitral award cannot form the basis of abuse of process. Um, now, and, th and then there's a long paragraph of 53 from the Lincoln National case in which Lord Justice Mann set out some of the reasons why arbitration is different for the purposes of abuse of process. In particular, it, it's a private. <coughs> or not a public one. We don't, we don't need to obviously worry about the detail of that, but a paragraph 54, and this is important, Lord Justice Simon said that he accepted those points as far as they go, but he didn't consider they supported the broad proposition. What is clear is that there are good reasons why a court should be cautious before accepting that a later court proceedings are an abusive process, because it involves a collateral attack on an earlier arbitral award. So, there is a difference in arbitration. It is less likely for a, a later proceeding to be abusive if the first proceeding is in arbitration. There's then a discussion of a Hong Kong case called Paraku, where similar arguments have been raised. And at paragraph 59, you can see that a similar <coughs> conclusion was reached in that Hong Kong case, that there were good reasons why arbitration was different, but not such as to completely rule out of court of the abuse of process by relitigation. Then at paragraph 60, your Lord should see that Mr. Justice Tears' paragraph 50 is set out in full. <coughs> and it's set out on page 262. Uh, and then um, another paragraph from Mr. Justice Tear, and then at 62, a similar approach was adopted by Mr. Justice Hamlin in Arts and Antiques. Uh, and then at 63, having cited Mr. Justice Tear's judgment, 49 and 50 of Mr. Justice Tear in the present case, Mr. Justice Hamlin continued, and you've seen that, and then the conclusion. Um, and then there's a reference to another case. And then if we come to page 2664, paragraph 66, Lord Justice Simon said, Mr. Samick was critical of the decisions in these cases, going so far as to contend that Arts and Antiques was wrongly decided. I reject his criticism. In my view, Mr. Justice Tear correctly stated the law in paragraph 50 of his judgment in the present case. There's no hard edge rule, um, etc. But at 68, I agree with Justice Reyes. <coughs> the point he makes there is that the court's concerned with abuse of its own process. Yes. And there, I mean, there are other cases where, I mean, for example, <coughs> an attempt to go behind a decision um, of. Um, the European Commission. There's a decision, Mr. Justice Laddie, um, that says that's an abuse. Um, there are cases involving, um, you know, the Solicitor's Disciplinary Tribunal and other other tribunals, where it's held that to, to go to seek to go behind can amount to an abuse. Yes. Um, yes, exactly. <coughs> so, so they, so they help. But what, what I what I want to particularly draw attention to is that we mm. there's one one thing is. As I've just shown you, the, the relevant parts of Mr. Justice Tier and Arts and Antiques are actually approved by this group yeah. here. Mm. But also, the conclusion at 68 is while arbitration is not a complete and clear part of the abusive process argument, it is right to say that the court will be particularly cautious where the abuse argument is founded on a previous arbitration award. Um, and it will be a rare case where there's a, a non party to the arbitration. It can be said to be abuse, um, and that's that's important then to understanding what uh, is said later. And uh, we then have the, the the court. Lord Justice Simon then moves to consider the judge's reason. And if we get to paragraph eighty-seven on page two six six eight, he turns to his own reasons for reaching a different <coughs> view. In the paragraph 88, there were a number of considerations that weighed against the conclusion of views. The first, paragraph 89, is the arbitration context. 
And then at paragraph 90, when Lord Justice Simon says, despite this, he now relied on the arbitration proceedings and award to characterise MWP's claim against him as an abuse, seeking to take the benefit of an arbitration award by which the Sinclair defendants would not have been bound in the case by the This was the point about lack of mutuality which plainly troubled the judge, and it was a highly material, if not dispositive, factor. Now, I, I need, that phrase is one that's been picked up by my learned friends in the judge, highly material, if not dispositive, and I just want to make a submission there. Of course, my lords, I accept that lack of mutuality is a point against him. Probably my learned friend's best point, and I would say pretty much his only point. Um, it was also a point that weighed on the claimant's side of the balance in all the earlier cases, including Taylor Walton and Arsene Antiques. But it, in those cases, it was not decisive. The phrase, A if not B, is capable of shades of meaning as to what the speaker is saying about B which you can sometimes convey in speech. A, A if not B, or A if not B. Um, that's open to interpretation. But in the case of paragraph uh, 90, we know what Lord Justice Simon meant by this. Because in theme 4 of paragraph 48, he said in exactly the same words that lack of mutuality is not dispositive. So we know when he says, um, material if not dispositive, he's actually accepting that it's not dispositive, but saying nevertheless it's highly material. And the context of that is the arbitration context. So it's more material there because of the arbitration context, which is a private arbitration, one which <coughs> Mr. Sinclair steadfastly refused to join. Well, he, he, he's, um, he reversed the bragging ACR because the point that was made there um, by Lord Justice Carr that, the <coughs> in fact, um, the Oceanus had, had tried to consolidate the two sets of proceedings, and that was resisted yes. by CTI. And That's absolutely right. And so I, I, think, I think I've made these submissions, but we do say that, that is, it's a very different situation, partly because you're talking about defendants, not claimants, um, in, the two, in seeking to well, the, the point, the comparison he's drawing is that Mr. Sinclair, that Michael Wilson had wanted Sinclair to agree to be party to the arbitration. But Mr. Sinclair, he didn't have to be, yeah. because it was an arbitration. But in fact, the whole thing could have been resolved in one forum if he'd agreed to arbitrate. But he didn't. He wouldn't agree. Yes. And the point, that, the point that Lord Justice Simon is making is, well, in, it lies ill in somebody's mouth in that circumstance. Say, so, well, you're now, now you're pursuing the claim against me as you have to, because I wouldn't agree to arbitrate. But it's an abuse. Yes, exactly. And it will be said against you, well, you, you didn't agree to consolidation. Well, that's right, my lord. And that's where, as I say, one, one has to look at the facts <coughs> in this case. And although we, did, we didn't immediately agree, we have perfectly legitimate reasons for that, which were, unlike Mr. Sinclair, whose only reason was he didn't want to, um, we had a perfectly legitimate reason, which was that the claim against us was bad. It pleaded in ways that were strikable, we wanted to bring that forward. And we couldn't be ready for a trial that had already been fixed. Now, none of that applied to Mr. Sinclair. We did make clear that we accepted it'd be better, that there was massive overlap, and it would be sensible for it to be tried together if they'd been brought together. It wasn't of our making that the claim against us was served so late. So we're in a, in a, in a completely different position. Um, and that's why it's the intensive focus on facts. That we, we, and also why arbitration is different, because we could have been forced to join. If my, if my learning friend could have pressed their application to the judge, we weren't saying it's essential for this trial to be heard in February 2016. We, we had no interest in that point. All we were saying was, if we are going to be joined, we need to be able to bring our summary judgment application first. We were not saying, you know, we stand in the last ditch about not being joined. And so that puts us in a very different position. And it means that the that you can't say the only reason these claims were not joined together was because of our stance. It really wasn't. The reason was the deal done between the claimants and the defendants to get the trial on. And the fact that the claim against us wasn't brought till later. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily anybody's fault, but I don't think there's any particular evidence about it. But the fact is the claimants took their election. But the fact is you did go along with that deal. I mean, it was a consent order. You didn't, yes. you didn't put forward the argument, which you could have done, saying... Okay, the other two parties, without our knowledge, have reached a deal, but it's not that simple. 
um, and you need to build in protections if there is to be a split trial as opposed to a combined one. And that didn't happen. Well, I accept, I accept yeah. that, my lord. I mean, I, you know, I have to say that, that, that's, yeah. that's absolutely right. But, but I say that that can't that can't excuse this well, kind it, of behaviour. Well, it must be a material factor again. I mean, it's a for factors on both sides, and I think that is one against you. Whether it's sufficient is another matter. No, I, I, I agree. Could point. be said. Well, by the time you got to the point where the claimants and Sequana would agree to save their trial. You'd have been there'd have been a slight sense of your baying at the moon if you if you tried to, <laughs> well, to, to insist upon well, you know, I mean, in, in, in practical terms that's right. I mean I do adopt that. I mean undoubtedly if we'd have said, well, hold on, actually we want to be in this trial. Uh, but at least you could have pressed for a direction that findings in the first trial were not to be upset in the second one or something of that kind. Well, we, we could have done, my lord, but then obviously that's a difficult decision for us if we weren't yes. uh, going to have the chance to participate. <laughs> right, it might have cut both ways. Yes. Which we wouldn't have the chance to do without causing the thing mm. to go off. Mm. And so ultimately, if it had been argued out, it may, what really should have happened probably is the claimant should have been put to an election as to whether they were going to insist on the trial being delayed, possibly at their cost, um, or take the risk that, that, um, that they might lose, mm. uh, and that that would equally mean they've lost against us. But my Lord, as I say, when one looks at the situation at the time, that wasn't a big risk for them because we weren't going to help them win. All we were going to do was add another person arguing the same thing against them. So they, they're not they're not giving up very much. They were never going to have two bites of the cherry. The only thing they're giving up is us being formally bound into any findings they get in their favour. But that's actually quite a small thing to give up in in reality. Because in reality, we would we would we would find it very hard to overturn them. So well, I do say one has to, you know, the only way to do this is to ask, well, what, you know, what is, if these things had been pulled out, what would anybody have thought might be the consequences? And, and whatever they were, they wouldn't be this, in my submission. Um, hmm. My Lord, uh, then there's the point, the other, the, other, the other distinguishing factor in Michael Wilson, apart from the fact that it was arbitration, which does make a difference. <coughs> is the fact that at 96 and 97 Lord Justice Simon relies on the fact at 97 that the tribunal didn't adjudicate on the claims in a way that bound MWP in relation to a non-party and that, that's not just the formalistic point <coughs> that Sinclair wasn't a party um, it, it's because the, the particular issues in that case were not ones to which the um, the arbitral parties were the obvious um, parties. So just to make that clear, the relevant parts of the award that, that were an issue here were findings that certain shares that had been registered to a company called EPIL were not held for the benefit of Mr. Emmett on trust for MWP, but instead, as Mr. Emmett contended, they were held by EPIL for Mr. Sinclair. So EPIL had these shares. Michael Wilson was contending they were held <coughs> by Ethel for Emmett and should be on trust for him because of Emmett's breaches of trust. Mm. And the arbitral tribunal said, no, they are, as Mr. Emmett said, actually held by Ethel for Sinclair. So the primary parties were for those issues were actually Ethel and Mr. Sinclair, neither of whom was a party to the arbitration. So it's a very, again, it, it, it's a very different situation. It's quite an important factor <coughs> in these cases is as to whether the first trial was really between the right parties and the second trial is just downstream of that. And that wasn't the case in this case. My Lord's and if I'm reading paragraph 95 correctly, that's what Mr Justice Andrew Smith effectively concluded when he dismissed the MW's challenge to the award because he said that it conferred no rights upon Mr Sinclair, the award conferred no rights upon Mr Sinclair. Yes. So that, that's obviously the straightforward jurisdiction point, he wasn't a party to the arbitration. But you say, in fact, it goes wider than that, because if you look at the, the detail of what was actually an issue, it was an either-or. The, the arbitration could only decide the either, so the or was remaining. Yes, exactly so, my lord. Yes, exactly. So it's a, in that sense, it's a very different case. And my learned friend's submission, which I need to deal with, that, that if I'm right, this case would have been decided differently, is quite wrong, because this case has these two key points, well, three perhaps. It's got arbitration, it's got the fact that it was the wrong parties in the arbitration, and it's got the fact that Mr Sinclair's resistance to joinder was considerably more uh, 
uh, steadfast than ours. And obviously, he had an election arbitration. <coughs> My Lord, so the, the, uh, the last authority I wanted to draw to your attention. He also had a. I mean, there was a. There was. A, I think he refers to it, doesn't he, at some point? Um, that. Um, yes, it's 96, 97. I have in mind. I think the fact that Saint Clair was a was a witness in the arbitration was funding the Mr. Ellis' mm. defence. Which he, which it was argued, or well, the judge found, were grounds which supported an abusive process argument. And the Lord Justice Simon really found that they were quite the contrary; they, they went the other way. Yes, so what Mr. Sinclair was doing was effectively funding the arbitration and running it, but not, uh, not agreeing to be bound by it. Yeah. So yeah. you know he could hardly turn around later and say, "Well, pursuing me is an abuse." Yeah. And it's exactly. So there are all these factors in this case which are not present in our case, which yeah. while the underlying facts of our case may be complex as any, the, the structure of the issues is actually uh, more like the simpler case. Mm. My Lord, I just wanted to draw your attention to um, Gazprom at tab 21, a decision of Mr. <coughs> Donald Eggers QC, the deputy. It was, it, it's a, a, a recent case, in fact, came out after the judgment in our case. And uh, it includes, we haven't put my Lord's decision in Kamoka in the bundle, but there's quite a lot of it extracted in, in this by Mr. McDonald Eggers. Uh, and um, I just want to take you to paragraph 37 on page 755, where the deputy judge extracts the principles <coughs> from the authorities. He's a man for the sub-paragraphs, isn't he, the deputy judge? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, extracts the principles. I'm not going to go through them all, but my Lord, um, I, they seem to be pretty accurately drawn from the authorities. But para so pr principle four on page 756, uh, in my submission, confirms the way I say one should read. Michael Wilson, that the facts and arbitration is a private process is a relevant consideration, um, and that that's some, one of the points that Michael Wilson stands for. And I say that is right. And then the other matter I wanted to draw to my Lord's attention is that is that Principle Six makes an attempt to um, identify some of the lower level considerations that may come into play in a. Um, <coughs> case. So also, I don't have time to go through them all and give you my submission on them, but I, I, your audience might be interested to see it. Um, it's, it's not a bad attempt at a, at a set of considerations. But, um, obviously, they all have different weights. No, no one's suggesting to score them. But, uh, we'll do it like well, Lord, um, the next, the last thing I want to do on the law head is to just go to the judgment of Mr. Justice Fancourt and uh, make my submissions about where he went wrong on the law. So that's uh, bundle one, tab seven. Paragraph. Uh, I'm going to page one, one, seven, and paragraph seventy five. see there is that the judge seems to have accepted my learning friend's submission that the key principle in the third line of 75 was, that the, was from Michael Wilson is that the lack of mutuality was a highly material if not dispositive factor. Now I don't know exactly what the judge thought Lord Justice Simon meant by that but I do say that it's the wrong phrase to extract from Michael Wilson because it's from the arbitration section not from the general section. Um, and we had this argument below, and uh, my learned friends put forward, and presumably still put forward, the, um, the argument that that is, is the right phrase. Um, then, my lords, he then sets out all the principles, 
And at 18, if we go to page 121, paragraphs 81 to 83, the judge took, set out what he drew from Lang and Arts and Antiques. And in my submission, he put the matter too narrowly in terms of them having to be the very same issues decided on the basis of the very same material. And I made my submissions when I showed you at Lang, that it's really decided as a matter of substance, it's whether it's substantively the same issues decided on in substance the same material. The judge seems to have taken it as being a, a very narrow window. And then in particular, a point I made right at the start, the judge seems to have understood that if a claimant can add on some other element to the claim, that will suffice to take it outside the rationale of those cases. But that is wrong. So that, where are you getting that, that point um, from? My Lord, uh, I don't think it's in those paragraphs, is probably the answer. Um, oh, sorry. It's, uh, no, 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 my Lord, that's my fault. I'm making the submission without the, without the right paragraphs. I may have to... All right, well, come back, come back. Don't, don't take the time. Yeah, I mean, he goes on to discuss it at 85, where he talks about other issues, other issues to be decided. Um, and 86, yeah, I'm, I'm reminded to look at paragraph 100. Yeah. 100, where he reaches the conclusion of the very last sentence, that the issues and the evidence will not be identical. Yes. Mm. Because of that, there's yeah. no collateral attack. That, that, that's, that, was the, that was the bit I had in mind. Yeah. Um, and, and I say that that's taking it too narrowly. Um, the right test is the one put forward by Lord Justice Buxton. The, the new evidence has to be such as to change the aspect of the case. Art and Antiques illustrates the point in a slightly different way, which is what, that if you've got a new claim, it may be that the new claim can continue, as in that case, one of the claims was stood on its own two feet and could continue. Um, but you, have, you, you, you can't just say, well, there's something that can continue, and so therefore I don't have to consider abuse anymore. Uh, so we say that the, the judge... Um, went wrong in that way. My lords, my last main heading is essentially my submissions on how the law applies to each of the four issues I outlined at the start. And I suspect we'll find that I've probably made most of these submissions already, so I'll, I'll probably keep pausing to skip over bits of my notes to try and avoid repetition. Um, the first issue is whether the common allegations are abusive. My Lords, I submit that the common allegations are the allegations that each of the two dividends was unlawful or could not be paid consistently with the director's duties because the relevant accounts for each dividend should have made greater provision for the Fox River liability or contained additional disclosures, including in particular disclosure of contingent liability for Kalamazoo. Those, are, those common allegations are the ones that BTI has fought out at massive expense on the ground of its own choosing against all the parties directly affected and with all relevant evidence available to it. BTI had the opportunity to appeal or at the very least seek permission to appeal on those issues um, but it chose not to appeal uh, and not to pursue um, the appeal on the subject of the accounts not being true and fair. So, my lords, we say that to allow BTI to challenge those findings at another trial with the most relevant parties not present is a clear abuse. If they succeeded, then it would mean that the High Court would have declared the dividends to be lawful as between the company, the directors, the only shareholder, and the main creditor with an interest in the matter, but also declared it to be unlawful as between the company and the auditor. That would bring our system of justice into disrepute, particularly when it had been arrived at by the means of the same claimant pursuing both claims. But the remedy, as has been said several times in the case law, is for the claimant to appeal, not to sue somebody else. And it is important that BTI is the claimant in both cases. In a lot of the cases where the courts have taken a, a have seen the question of abuse more, in a more complex way, it is often because a party is a defendant is entitled to defend themselves against other claims and is in a different position. But BTI is bringing both of these claims. As we've seen, the evidence of the trial was very complete, far more complete as could be, than would be expected at any PWC trial. 
And the participation of the directors is absolutely key, as well as their accounting staff. Um, there was expert evidence, which, now, my Lord, um, Mr. Uh, one point on which I very much support the judge is that he was absolutely right to find that when Mrs. Justice Rose held that the estimates of the provision were best estimates, she was making findings on an objective basis, not merely on the basis of what the directors thought at the time. Um, the judge goes through that, uh, and uh, I, I've avoided going back to it, but, but uh, you've seen to some extent in the judgment of Mrs. Justice Rose um, the extent to which she did consider the expert evidence in reaching those conclusions. There's no real sign of new evidence. My learned friends have said in their skeleton that they're going to change expert witnesses, but it's no identification of whether the new ones are going to say anything different, and if so, what. Um, there was a suggestion in, in Mr. Lloyd's witness statement that there might be some more documents, but uh, as far as that's concerned, we adopt what Mr. Justice Bancourt said about it at paragraph 96 of his judgment, uh, namely that it's really a hopeless submission at this stage, and even now. Uh, and the respondent's notice doesn't challenge paragraph 96, and even now there's no hint of what they might contain. It really is Macawberism on stilts. So we say that actually, when properly analysed, this case is indistinguishable from Lang and Arts and Antiques, and the same result should follow. Not because abuse is decided as a matter of authority, but because a close examination of the facts shows that it is the same situation, and it's the situation that we have to tolerate. The second issue is whether there is abuse in relation to the additional allegations. Now, for the most part, the additional allegations would directly impugn Mrs. Justice Rose's findings. For example, the allegation that PricewaterhouseCoopers ought to have refused to accept the provision in the 2007 accounts on the grounds that the 60% assumption was too optimistic would plainly involve relitigating the issue that BTI dropped, because there is no basis for suggesting it was all different in 2007. That's a claim that could have been made but has not been, and because it isn't available on the facts. And whether you call that a Henderson and Henderson point, as you might, or whether you treat it generally as being the whole claim is substantively an abuse, it is abusive for a point like that to be argued as if it hadn't in reality been determined. And it has been determined by being dropped because it was unarguable in the face of all the relevant evidence. There's the argument made in my learned friend's skeleton for this appeal that the provision should have been lower on the grounds that contributions from other PRPs were not virtually certain. Now, obviously, that impugns the final decision that the provision was not a best estimate, sorry, that the provision was a best estimate. Clearly, the point was available to BTI below because Mrs. Justice Rose noted that Aon said that the contributions met that standard at paragraph 255 negotiated this morning, and she referred to the requirement when she summarised FRS 12 at paragraph 377. So it was available to them. Um, I don't think I actually know what happened to the point. There are then three points that were relied on that the judge refers to at paragraph 85 of his judgment, the um, OU1 liability for modelling errors and the going concern assumption. The first Sorry, that was paragraph which? Uh, 85 of Mr Justice Fancourt. Mm, thank you. Um, the first two are numerical points that could in theory have led to the 2008 provision being higher than it was. So again, those are points which, if they were going to be taken, should have been taken. The suggestion by Mr Lloyd in his evidence is that the OU1 point was shut out for being brought in too late. Why was it? That doesn't make things better for BTI. It really just emphasises how it would bring the process into disrepute to allow a point like that, which is relevant to the final decision between the relevant parties, <coughs> to allow them to then reinvigorate a claim against somebody else, on, which would otherwise be abusive on the basis that they raised it too late first time round. So we, we say you can't, you know, you, you, it's actually doubling up on this. And the third of those points is going concern. Now I've already made the point that an attack on going concern is an attack on Mrs. Justice Rose's finding that the company was not likely to become insolvent. It's not improved by backdating it to 2007 because the claimant's case is that the situation then was better, not worse. And then uh, finally on this, there's my learned friend's case that Mrs Justice Rose did not expressly decide 
that all the accounting disclosures were adequate. But she said that was irrelevant to whether the dividend was properly payable. So that is an additional allegation on their case. But the only reason she didn't decide it was because she held them irrelevant. And she did then, in any event, look at the key ones. And not only that, but it, she did hold, expressly and in terms, that all of the matters that they say should have been formally disclosed in the account <coughs> were ones that the directors considered in any event. <coughs> so it would be, so to now argue that making those disclosures would have made a difference ultimately to whether the dividends would have been paid is abusive because it does involve going back on the findings that A, they're not relevant, and B, the directors were aware of them. In other words, it's, it's 10 past 3, it's not for me, the third, third issue uh, is no real prospect on the common allegation. And if I'm wrong about abuse, and we say there's no real prospect, obviously the points are closely related. The argument is founded on the fact that the really relevant participants all gave evidence, and there's no reasoned basis to expect a different result at trial. Of course, different judges could take different views of the same facts, but there's no reason basis to expect it to happen here. An important part of this is that Mrs. Justice Rose held that the provisions were the best estimates after considering the expert evidence as well as the factual material, and I, I think I said already that Mr. Justice Bancourt agreed with us about that point. The reference to his judgment on that is paragraphs 27 to 36, and we adopt what he says there about that. Um, and we also draw attention to paragraph 71 of his judgment.
Um, yes. Just to interrupt myself for, for one moment, um, the Bragg case has been mentioned a couple of times. And I just uh, remind my lords that our reply to reliance on Bragg is in our short supplemental skeleton at tab five, um, which is and it's a paragraph three. And I don't think I can put it. In oh, the real point. I was a defend, it was the defendant which, which had already, which had sought consolidation, which had been resisted. And which was a disadvantage, from recollection. Yes, that's yes. right. It was a disadvantage. Sorry, you referred to a supplemental skeleton. Is that in the bundle? It is. Um, the oh, it is. Yes. Yes. yes absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. It's a, short, it's a very. Sh it's a short. Yes. Yeah. Reply yeah. points. Yeah. Paragraph yes. three. Yes, indeed. I can't. I can't put it any better than we put it in paragraph three. So yeah. Sorry. Yes. You know, just won't thank me for reading it out. Yeah. Um, when I was going back to where I was, I was making submissions about the the question of no real prospect first on the common allegation. I was going to. I wanted to address specifically what the judge said about this. He dealt with it in his judgment at tab seven, fairly briefly, really, paragraphs 105 to 107. And, um, this is where he's dealing with reliance specifically, isn't it? 105. Yes. Um, I mean, it's under the heading of, well, he calls it no new material evidence, but I think um, <coughs> uh, he's really dealing with the no realistic prospect of success point here. But yeah. on the substance, he refers back to the question about what the directors did or would have done. And then at 101, he says, I turn now to the argument based on causation. And, and I have rather regarded... 102 onwards is really dealing with that element of the, the negligence yes. case. Mm. You, you, I, my lord may well be right about that. Um, it, it seems to be the place where he specifically deals with no real prospect. It may, as I said, there yeah. is a close relationship between collateral attack and no real prospect, so it may yeah. be that his reasons on the second point are. Anyway, you were taking us to 105, did you say? Well, I, I wanted to deal with those anyway, and I, I hope that what I said already probably deals with uh, areas where I disagree with the judge on, on the earlier part. Um, but your lordship, I think, is right to call me up on that. Um, but 105, there are some specific reasons that I, I, I would like to deal with. Um, first, the judge says about, well, he says that there's no base, it's not possible to say directors would have disregarded material information. It cannot be concluded on this application that if PwC had questioned the amount of the provision or required disclosure of a risk of greater liability, it would be fine on the basis of the proposed provision to give an unqualified order of court for the going concern. The directors would not have changed the um, amount of the, the, changed the contents of the account. So stopping at that sentence, PwC did not have a duty to question the amount of the provision. They had a duty to audit the provision. We now know that it is it was a best estimate, certainly for real prospects purposes. Um, in those circumstances, PwC had no duty to question whether it was right or not. They certainly had a duty to ask enough questions to satisfy themselves it was right. But given that it was right, they were perfectly entitled to say so. In other words, it doesn't. It doesn't it doesn't quite work, and it seems that the judge has, has not properly understood the, the, the narrow nature of the claim against PwC, which is that it, it failed as an audit. Um, Sorry, can I make, make sure I've got this straight? So you're saying the only thing they had to be satisfied about was that this was genuinely the best estimate put forward by the directors? On the estimate, yes. They, they are not concerned about whether it should have been larger or lesser, or at least not directly so. Well, it's the same question, though. Well, they, I, yes, I know it is, but it's... <laughs> they, they, they had to consider whether that was... A, that's, I mean, it's, it is one of the features of estimates in accounts. Yes. Is that the directors have a margin of appreciation. Sure, the I understand that. Is to yes. say, is this a, a proper estimate that mm. reasonable directors could have reached? But to do that, they have to inform themselves about the parameters. Don't they? And, they do. You know, to, and if necessary, take advice themselves so they can understand the issue. Yes, absolutely. I accept that. And, mm. and, and on a real prospects basis, what my, my submission... We know from the judgment what those inquiries would have revealed. They would have revealed that it was a proper best estimate, based on all the information that could have been made available. And in those circumstances, the auditors had no further duty to say to the directors, are you sure you want to make this provision? That, that's not the auditor's duty. They, 
their duty then is to say, yes, this is a proper commission. Well, if it, was, it, it, it mm. goes like this, doesn't it? The, the, all, the directors produce the provision, which is, which, which is a best estimate. The auditors, uh, as part of their audit function, will ask the directors questions about things like estimates, um, contingent liabilities, and so forth. And they will get an answer, and the answer they get on this hypothesis, on the basis of Mrs. Justice Rose's judgment, would be effectively a distillation. What she found was the exercise in which the directors had engaged in arriving at the best estimates. Yes. And what you're really saying is it's inconceivable that another judge second time round could or could reach the conclusion that if they had been made a further inquiry than the one the auditors did make, they would somehow have got an answer from the directors which would have led them to, to say, well, actually, this isn't the best estimate at all. Yes, that's exactly right. <coughs> and, and trying to put it sort of more precisely in terms of the test I, I have to satisfy, I would say that it, there is no real prospect um, of it being established that any competent auditor had to reach the different uh, different conclusion to the one reached by Mrs. Justice Rose. That's actually the, the you know, I'm going to open my own friends on this. Similarly, if PwC had required disclosure of a risk of greater liability, among this, this is no doubt why it's under the reliance head, we know from the judgment that the directors are well aware of that. And, uh, and this is the point that I made by reference to the cases referred to by the judge in paragraph 104, that the way causation in audit claims work is that somebody has to rely <coughs> on, the, on the wrong information from the auditors. And if the auditors mm. fail to require disclosure of something, that can be relied on if the directors didn't know it, or the shareholders didn't know it. That's more likely in the case of disclosure. Um, but where everybody does know it, that can't you can't lead anywhere. And then finally, in the sentence I've just read, what if PwC had declined to give an unqualified report on the basis of going concern? But my lords, again, unless one can undo the findings about the level of the provision being wrong. You can't get to any duty on an auditor to insist on a going concern qualification. And then and then at the end of this paragraph, the judge says that it's not possible to say that if advice had been given that AWA should make provision based on the highest figure in a range of estimates. That was something the directors already knew. My Lord, there's two points here. The premise can't be right unless the actual provision was not the best estimate. But secondly, the, the judge fails, again, it's failing to appreciate the role of the auditor. It is not the role of the auditor to advise the directors on how to make their provision. It's the role of the auditor is to ask them how they've made their provision and to say if it's acceptable or not. And th there's no allegation. To, to which this this sentence corresponds. <coughs> so, my lords, we say none of the points in paragraph 105 support a real prospect. Then, at paragraph 106, the judge takes up BTI's argument about the need for independent advice from an expert lawyer or consultant. Um, or advice from PwC about qualifications or disclosure. So taking those one by one, first, the directors lacked independent advice from a lawyer or consultant about what would be a prudent provision to make. Well, my lords, we know that the directors had several you know, experts and consultants, including lawyers, advising it throughout this process. That's very clear throughout the judgment. The judge seems to have taken on board the allegation that's made that PwC should have insisted under FRS 12 on some further expert being employed by the company. Um, there are several objections to this. The first is there's actually no requirement in UK generally accepted accounting principles that would enable an auditor to insist on an independent expert. The reference that my learned friends give to this is not actually to FRS 12, because it doesn't 
entertaining. It's actually to ISA 620. And ISA 620 is an auditing standard, which makes clear that where necessary, the auditor may need to employ an expert to understand the underlying figures in the case. Um, secondly, the point was raised as an objection to the provision before Mrs. Justice Rose. And I showed you at paragraphs 378 to 381 um, that she had dealt with the point in terms that there weren't enough experts. And she also viewed the key requirements to be nice at 620, even though my learned friends had tried to persuade her that FRS 12 was relevant on the issue. So that's all at 378 to 381. Thirdly, as I showed you, she didn't accept that Mr. Gower was not independent at paragraph 398, and she did not accept that the required legal advice was taken, paragraph 414, the paragraphs I showed you this morning. Fourth, the fact that the company had used outside experts was actually stated in the accounts that I showed you. I showed you that in the judgment of paragraph 437. BTI complained about that at the trial, but the judge did not accept their complaint. And fifth, even if some further expert had been appointed over and above those that were, what would they have said? Mrs. Justice Rose had the benefit of circular experts, all their reports exchanged, cross-examined. She still concluded that the provisions were the best estimates that could be reached at the time, and that the dividends were lawful. So how is there a real prospect, in the absence of something quite specific being put forward, that some other expert would have said something different? No explanation comes forward. And then uh, the next word, the last bits of 106 I want to deal with are, nor had there any advice from PwC about qualifications or disclosure that were appropriate in the account. And again, there is no advisory engagement alleged. I'm not sure what <coughs> the judge meant by qualifications in this context. Usually that means a qualification in the audit report, which is never appropriate in the accounts, um, because it means it's something the auditor doesn't accept. There's no case made that PwC should have given advice about qualifications or disclosure. <coughs> the point is that PwC could have insisted on more disclosures, then I think I probably already dealt with that, but it falls foul of Mrs. Justice Rose's uh, approach to the disclosures, the fact that it was all known to the My Lord's Paragraph 107. How can the accounts present a true and fair view if they should have had a qualification? Uh, well, well, that is, well, I, my lord, I think that's right. I think my lady friend might say <coughs> that they can if they, well, I think he relies on the fact that, that the judge, that the Mrs. Justice Rose didn't need to deal with all the disclosures uh, on her primary finding because they didn't affect whether a dividend was properly payable. Um, so she only dealt with them in an arbiter way. Uh, and I think, I think he relies on that. And my lord, as to that, we, we say if, if it isn't relevant to the dividend, then it doesn't get him anywhere in this claim. And we know that the directors knew the facts he says should have been disclosed. And so did the only shareholder. So it doesn't go anywhere. It might go somewhere in another case, but not in this case. Um, and then 107 relates only to the second dividend, which is the smaller one. And it misunderstands the requirement for reliance. So 107, the judge says, if the auditors have not signed off, then the second dividend on the, on the basis of the 2008 audited accounts could not have been paid because they had to have accounts. Um, my Lord, that, that is a, a but-for point, but it is not reliance on the audit report. The judge says it was, and that's the point I was seeking to um, unsuccessfully to disabuse him of with the authorities referred to at paragraph 104 of his judgment. Um, but that is not reliance. We've cited the authorities for that proposition in our skeleton at paragraph 62, and they include the recent um, uh, case in the Supreme Court really confirming that Berg's, Berg and Adams is the right approach, that the only <coughs> reliance on an audit report means reliance on the information in the report. So somebody is misled by the audit report, not they can use it to wave it around to somebody else. That's not reliance on the audit report itself. Um, and then in any event on 107, the question then arises, well, wh what qualification is there a real prospect that BTI can establish was required? And that's what I think my Lord just put to me. If the accounts were true and fair uh, and had sufficient disclosures as far as re relevant to the dividend, 
then what's the basis for alleging that PwC had to qualify the audit report in a way that could have made any difference? No. So, my lords, the judge, we say, was um, on this issue seduced by the siren voice singing, well, on difficult matters, it's always best to leave it to trial. Um, but actually, on proper examination, there's nothing here that could meet the summary judgment test. Um, in many ways, it's because the case is, there's no specifics in this case, and we know the answer on the specifics that already existed. Um, my learned friends say in their skeleton, well, if it's only about causation, then that must be an issue for trial. Which we say, my lords, no. The question is whether the prospect of success is realistic or fanciful. Now, of course, in many cases, causation is something that's hard to decide uh, at the summary judgment stage. But this is not a normal case, because in this case, you, you had a very long trial. And so a lot of the facts were a lot clearer than they normally are. Um, so we do say that in that sense, this isn't a normal case. And that in particular, what's missing is particularization of the causation case. What exactly would have led to these dividends not being paid? It's never particularized. And the people who matter for that purpose are the directors, all of whom have given evidence and been cross-examined at great lengths. I mean, that, yes. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and my lord, the final uh, heading of submissions I need to make is in relation to no real prospect with the additional allegations. Um, so are there some additional allegations which, if they're not abusive, could survive the summary judgment test? We say the answer is no. My learned friends clearly accept that most of their supposedly new points will involve inconsistency with Mrs. Justice Rose. We can see that from their skeleton argument, which I think I need to ask you to turn up, uh, so tab four if it's in the bundle, paragraph 59. We can see it because at paragraph 59 they identify two examples which they say are points that um, would not involve inconsistency with the findings of Mrs. Justice Rose. They've come up with two. The first of those is the disclosures in the accounts. And they positively rely <coughs> on the fact that Mrs. Justice Rose held that such disclosures were irrelevant to the payment of the dividend, to the ability to pay the dividend. But if that finding is not going to be challenged, then what's the basis for saying that any further disclosures would have made any difference? Um, with one exception, which is Kalamazoo, the content of the disclosure are all matters that Mrs. Justice Rose has found the directors were fully aware of. We give the references to that in paragraph 57 of our skeleton. I, think I, may, have, I may have said that earlier. Um, but the specific references to each individual disclosure are in our skeleton at 57. So if PwC had refused to sign the sign the being disclosed, that could not have made any difference to the director's state of knowledge or understanding. Um, and there's no suggestion that some other evidence that the directors have given or would give will make any difference here. The one exception is Kalamazoo, and on that, as we say in paragraph 58 of our skeleton, the judge held that it was in fact the law. And I've shown you that in the judgment. Sorry, say that again. In Kalamazoo, to Kalamazoo. That, that's the one where they say it should have been disclosed that there was an, a contingent of liability. And the answer to that is that the judge found that actually it was remote and therefore did not need disclosing under accounting principles. Mm. And I showed you that in the judgment yeah. at paragraphs. 443 to 4-5. The second point that my learning friends identify as not inconsistent is goodwill. And to evade the inconsistency, we've obviously identified the inconsistency between a, a, an insistence that the um, I'm sorry, I don't mean goodwill at all, do I? No, I'm don't. saying yes, goodwill, I mean go going concern. Yes. Those, those <laughs> notes I was about to say. Too late at night. <laughs> yeah. I know it's all in form, but it's printed in form. I don't think we've had any goodwill so far. <laughs> no, I think it may have more to do with what I wrote the notes than the, what time it is now. So the second point is going concern. Now, we've obviously identified um, an inconsistency between the argument that the auditors had to say there was that, it, that the account shouldn't be repaid on a going concern basis and the finding that the company was not in danger of insolvency. 
So to get around that, by, by a bit of their case which is not inconsistent, my learned friends focus here on their argument that PwC should have included an emphasis of matter only ongoing concern. And we know, in fact, there was an emphasis of matter about how uncertain the provision was, and that made no difference to the payment of the second guinea. And we know that the directors had the Section 43 purpose of the second guinea. So what is the reason, real, real prospect argument that an emphasis of matter about doubt as to going concern would have made any difference. In my submission, that is fanciful. It's not realistic. It's something that lawyers can dream up, and which has no basis in reality. There's been no suggestion that they'd spoken to the directors about this or could call them at trial to say that this would have made all the difference. Um, it, it is, it is uh, absolutely in the corner of it. And the fact that these are the two best points that my learned friends can alight on as being arguments of theirs that do not contradict is in my submission uh, quite significant. These are these two subparagraphs are that rare thing. They are an exception that proves the rule. They show you by their exceptionality that the rest of the case is indeed in substance a collateral attack. The judge. Um, the judge seems to have been impressed by the argument that the 2007 accounts were not adjudicated on by Mrs. Justice Rose. And in that respect. He seems to have lost sight of the limited duty, limited nature of PwC's duty. Um, I probably, I, I'm sure I've made this point in substance, but just to link it specifically to the judgment, paragraphs 89, 90, and 91, the judge seems to have been alleging that in auditing the 2007 accounts, PwC, sorry, alleging isn't the word, the judge seems to have been uh, understanding that, that uh, BTI are alleging that in auditing the accounts, PwC would have been advising the directors to make different provisions or disclosures. And uh, that's not what is alleged in the particular complaint, as I've shown you. There is no such allegation. Um, so, and I think, as I said, when we looked at the particular claim, in theory, on other facts, such an argument might be made. That maybe an auditor had a, had a duty to advise. But that's not uh, what this case is. Um, the judge may have understood that that was what was being said. But if so, um, he was misled as to what the uh, actual claim is. So in order to the claim that my learned friends actually want to run in relation to the 2007 accounts is that the defects that they alleged existed in the 2008 accounts were also present in 2007 and as it happens Mrs Justice Rose didn't have to deal with that. It is still a collateral attack because it's the same defects um, and it is also unsustainable on the facts. There's no real prospect of it succeeding. Um, again, nothing specific to explain why it might. The other points not expressly determined are no better. The short answer to the modelling errors is they fell within the margin of error. Um, and the answer on the underlying only one issue, which relates only to the 2008 accounts, in which BTI say they were refused permission to police specifically, is given in, in our skeleton at paragraph 56.1. There are numerous parts of the judgment referenced there where Mrs Justice Rose set out the basis for the OU1 credit, and there's no real prospect of that being contradicted, and again, my learned friends have given no specific basis. Um, my Lord, uh, if I can assist you further, I'm very happy to do so. If not, I'm even more happy to, uh, to manage to conclude and leave time for my reply tomorrow. No, I think that's fine for now. Thank you very much indeed, Mr. Falsado. Yes, Mr. Thompson, when you're my ready. Lord, thank you. Uh, my Lord, like my learned friend, I'm under a certain amount of time pressure. There are a lot of points involved, as my lords will have seen from the skeleton arguments and the oral submissions. We're going to try to deal with them very much in a systematic order, so as to make sure I deal with everything and uh, do so as effectively and quickly as possible. Uh, it's quite important as part of this in my submission, my lords, to keep the various points that arise separate. Um, what my lords have heard today has involved a certain amount of bleeding of points one into the other. Very important in our submission to keep them separate and be very clear at any point which issue one is talking about. So I'll try to do that. Now, just by way of introductory comment, my lord, we of course say that the judge was right for the right reasons, but my lords will have seen that we also, in the respondent's notice, 
do identify a number of points. Most of the points which uh, the learned judge did refer to. And, and really, it's a matter of emphasis. We've just made sure that we are putting those points before this court, so there's no question as to whether they are available to us. And the reality we say about this case, and the reason why we've ended up doing that really, is that PwC bears a very heavy burden here <coughs> in showing why this is a rare case where it is an abuse to litigate a point which has not previously been litigated between the parties. And why, despite the fact that neither side was bound by the uh, decision and the findings in the first set of proceedings, nevertheless, these proceedings would somehow bring the administration of justice into disrepute. And because of that, there are many reasons we say why that There are many reasons why the application fails. And really, it's a question of choosing which reason one chooses to emphasize. Now, what we're going to do is set out a positive argument, my lords, then, all, then deal responsibly with the points that PwC makes. And in doing so, I'm afraid I won't necessarily be all that rigorous in identifying when I'm merely supporting something that Mr. Justice Fancourt decided and when I'm making a respondent's notice point. Because, as I say, there's a great deal of overlap between the two. I hope that's not inconvenient. Well, I think the important point is the respondent's notice ensures that the issue is, are all in the arena, so to speak, but quite how your submissions divide up between one and the other doesn't matter as long as you're within the scope of their combined scope. My Lord, I'm most grateful. Now, just a couple of terminological points. Um, it may make it quicker if at various points I refer to the first set of proceedings and the second set of proceedings, both in reference to these proceedings, but also uh, when making general submissions about points of principle. Uh, and also, therefore, to the first and to the second defendant, again, referring to the defendant in the first set of proceedings and the defendant in the second, rather than numerically in this set of proceedings. That's a bit more apt to confuse. Speaking for myself. Is it? Well, I'll try not to <laughs> that case. Oh, um, I mean, of course I know what you mean, but... No, I won't do, do that in that I mean, case. I mean, there are two different defendants on the record, although, of course, AWA is effectively can be ignored. My Lord, yes. Now, the other terminological point is that Malone Friend frequently refers to collateral attack in, in very generic terms. Now, that's fine. Um, he has, I think, been using it fairly liberally to refer to any occasion on which a party in a subsequent set of proceedings is inviting a different conclusion on an issue yeah. to that reached by the court in the first set of proceedings. Now that's fine, but it's very important to bear in mind in our submission that such <coughs> is not necessarily abusive. Mm. There is a difference between a collateral attack, which may or may not be abusive, and an abusive collateral attack. It's the latter, obviously, that my learned friend has to persuade the court that one has here. Yes, if you have a general principle that you could never seek a different conclusion on an issue in the second set of proceedings than one that's already been made in the first, I mean, that would make life very difficult. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. And, and the, the, there's plenty of authority, uh, Paul and Simons referred to in Wilson, that there is nothing inherently abusive about inviting inconsistent decisions. There's got to be something more. Yeah, and that's and not the, around. And then normally, the mechanisms which prevent that kind of thing happening are the doctrines of, well, um, issue estoppel and um, res judicata. Absolutely. Mm. So, with those introductory comments, uh, I'll move on, I hope, very quickly to the law, because as uh, my lords have seen, there isn't a huge amount of divergence between us. The real divergence arises in the application of the law to the facts of this case, of course. But there are some important principles which I just want to remind the court of before setting out on that task. First, of course, where there is no res judicata or issue estoppel, one has got to find the abuse in terms of unfairness <coughs> to the private interest of one of the parties or where that isn't the case, as it is common ground, it isn't here, 
by identifying a, an abuse in terms of bringing the administration of justice into disrepute. Second, there is no prima facie assumption of abuse where one is inviting an inconsistent decision, as I've just indicated. And I should say these are uh, points that we have essentially set out in our respondent skeleton argument, paragraph 18 onwards. So the objectionable element where there is an abuse is not the inconsistency in itself. Uh, as it was put in the Michael Wilson case, this is at paragraphs 94 to 95, uh, the court in a case in the second proceedings which do not involve an abuse is free to reach an outcome which is irreconcilable with the first set of proceedings. And third, it's common ground that this requires a close merits-based analysis of the facts. Fourth, it is, as I've already indicated, a rare case where the litigation of an issue not previously decided between the same parties will involve an abuse. And my Lord says, seen the authority for that. They're referred to in Wilson at 44 and 48. That's particularly Norris and also the Oceanus case. And fifthly, making a similar but important point, it's a powerful factor against a finding of abuse where there is no mutuality. Now, leaving aside whether that is dispositive or merely highly material factor, it is at least a very powerful factor against the finding of abuse. And there we refer to the general statement of principle in Wilson at 48, subparagraph 4, referring to the Bearstone case, at paragraph 38. Sixthly, one highly material factor is also whether the claimant in the second proceedings has unsuccessfully sought a joint hearing of the two claims. Uh, there's a very powerful dictum which I know my lords will have seen in our skeleton argument in Oceanus from Lord Justice Carr. And this is our skeleton at paragraph 26, just from my lords note. Whereas here consolidation was in fact sought by the party in question I cannot begin to see how any question of abuse of the process of the court could be said to arise. And the learned Lord Justice went on then to say, and this is pertinent, it must be accepted that the situation may result in inconsistent decisions by different judges on identical issues, albeit against the background of two trials, which may take somewhat different courses. So there's a recognition there that there is a, an inherent risk of inconsistent decisions. And two trials may simply take a different course. Uh, and that's an important point, actually, when one comes on to consider my learned friend's second ground, that essentially there's no real prospect of a different outcome on any issues which overlap, simply because of the way in which they were decided in the first set of proceedings. But I'll deal with that separately. I'll just flag that for the moment. Now, it's true that, of course, the Oceanus case was dealing with a, a situation where a defendant was being accused of an abuse by raising a point by way of defence. But the principle is cited in entirely general terms in Wilson, and it's not restricted to the situation where it is the defendant which is raising the point that's been decided before. Now, there's one further short point I'd like to draw out of the Aldi case, which I hope doesn't involve getting into the, the facts. It's, it's really Sorry, this. Which case? The, the Aldi, Aldi Stores case. Oh, Aldi Stores, yeah, yeah. Now, it, it's this point that it, it is a relevant consideration as to the extent to which the relevant parties, and that includes not just the party making the abuse argument, but the, the claimant in the second set of proceedings, uh, have put their cards on the table at an earlier stage. Uh, and in particular, paragraphs 21 and 22, uh, this court in the Aldi case 
noted the fact that Aldi in that case, which was the, the claimant accused of abusing the process, had made its intentions clear at an early point to the defendants, and that the defendants had not made their position clear. And that they hadn't said that, well, as far as they were concerned, it would be an abusive process if they were pursued later. That is a relevant factor. Have the parties put their cards on the table? There was another case that I was involved in at the bar where this point came up called Kennecott and Lynette. I don't know if anybody's looked at that. But I, I had, a, in the context of that examination of what was going on about joinder and consolidation, I had a, I had a sort of flashback to whether, the, now I'm, you know, I may be setting a complete hair running. It was a decision of the Court of Appeal presided over from recollection by Lord Justice Chadwick. Um, but I may just be, I may be, just, I may be just simply glowing in having, for once in my life, been Mr. John Consumption Fusey. <laughs> <laughs> but it might just be worth, it's reported, I think, in the Lloyd's Law Report, so it might just be worth having a look. Yeah, thank Maybe you. We can certainly follow that hair and see, see <coughs> where it leads. Thank you. And the other point we, we get out of Aldi is, is a point that um, is made in the judgment of Lord Justice Longmore. But he drew attention to the fact that, in that case, Aldi had not behaved in any way culpably or improperly and had been in a difficult position. Uh, uh, that is paragraph 40. And, and Lord Justice Wall, and similar lines in the same case, paragraph 34, observed that he regarded Aldi's conduct as being commercially reasonable, forensically legitimate, and reasonably transparent. And we, we make that point because it, it is significant Sorry, where? previous pause, Mr. Oh. Um. Sorry, it's nice to see George Well, perhaps if you just give us a test before you continue, just so we can be sure. I'll do that. Okay. How is that? Yes, that's much better. It's yes. better. Brilliant. Thank okay. Thank Do we need much. to rerun what you just said, or you? <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Can we? Yep. Okay. We'll carry on. Then. Thank you very much. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can. Thank you. Now, um, the, the point is where one is considering whether the administration of justice is being brought into disrepute, whether a claimant is behaving in an abusive manner. One has to look at the conduct of <clears throat> the claimant to some extent. Where the conduct of the claimant has been reasonable and not in any way improper. That is in our submission quite insignificant. As regards the burden, I believe it's common ground that it's not for the claimant to justify bringing a second set of proceedings, but it's for the defendant who alleges abuse to establish that. And in Wilson, importantly, as we've set out in the skeleton argument, my lords, it was that was described as a high threshold. That's paragraph 87. And the test to be satisfied was described as especially exacting. And that's paragraph 91. With common ground that it's a matter of discretion, but the court, this court, should take... Sorry, I apologise. It's not, not, a, not, not a matter of discretion. discretion. <laughs> but nonetheless, the court should take... Uh, should uh, give considerable weight to the views of the first instance judge. Particularly of her member of the commercial court, we were told, and to which I would wish to add if also if a chancery judge. <laughs> I'm happy to endorse that. <laughs> now, <laughs> what was that? And the technology and construction. <laughs> Indeed, any, any well, be happy there too. <laughs> any you know, specialist, any, specialist, any, specialist court. Court. any judge in the business and property court. Yes. <laughs> and, and finally, my lord, ninthly, this isn't actually a point that has to be determined at the interlocutory stage. There's the Malik decision which we've put in uh, the bundle where the judge decided that it was not safe to decide whether it would be an abuse at the interlocutory stage and adjourn the matter to trial. So the Is point that was Mr. Justice Hawkes. That's correct. Yes. Malik and Malik. And, uh, obviously on its own facts, yes. uh, uh, we're not for a moment suggesting, as I think my own friend Skeleton suggests, that it has to be done. All we're suggesting is it is an available course. It's an available option. On the other hand, I mean, the 
jurisdiction would lose a lot of its benefit if it didn't succeed in avoiding massive expense of money and court time, etc., in a case which is actually doomed, um, doomed to fail. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we're, not in, we're, not, we're not positively inviting the court to do it. No, and I think... It, it, it is there. I mean, that's a feature of the business of property courts, that they do spend all their time rolling their sleeves up, trying to sort out the parties' disputes before a, whatever this was, 32-day trial. Absolutely. Mm. So, so, I mean, one understands, of course, that if in doubt, you leave it to the trial, but um, um, the judges do try and be helpful. Absolutely, yes. And it's not a, not a match. This is a different point to leaving a question of summary judgment, for example, to trial. Mm. It, it, it is if the, the, the situation facing the judge in, in Malik and Malik was simply that uh, until one heard the evidence at trial, it wasn't possible to tell whether the allegation that was said to be to constitute the abuse was actually correct or not. So it simply had to be left over. Yeah. But I, I don't want to take too much time on that. So, well, that's the law. Now, what I'd like to do um, in the time available is deal with the first of our main arguments in relation to applying those principles to the facts. Now, the <coughs> the point that I would like to deal with the rest of the time available this afternoon, if I can, is what I would call the case management point. It may not be a very apt way of putting it, but it's, it's the significance of the circumstances in which, uh, as, as I think it was put early, early, these two sets of proceedings came to be separated. Yeah. <coughs> putting yeah. that in, in, a, in a neutral way. Now, This um, issue, we say, makes it absolutely clear that even if these proceedings would otherwise potentially be abusive, in that context, they clearly aren't. Mm. And this is one of the points where, frankly, we do place greater emphasis than was placed uh, by the learned judge. And the learned judge did uh, take it into account, as one sees from paragraph 100 of his judgment, which is quite a, if I can say so, with respect, compelling summary of the position to which I think my learned friend took the court a little earlier, where the learned judge summarizes <coughs> his conclusion that it's not an abuse. And in that, he takes into account uh, the, the fact that he really takes into account six points. First, the claims were live for a long time before the judgment said to render them an abuse. They were stayed, but not on terms that restricted their revival in any way. Third, it's only a rare case where the second proceedings will be an abuse by the defendant of the proceedings of the party. <coughs> First proceedings, that is especially so, he noted, if the second proceedings were already issued and there was a bona fide attempt to have them heard together. So he clearly took the, that point into account. And the issues were not identical, and the evidence is not identical. Mm. And I want to focus and place greater emphasis on that fourth point. That is the timing of the two sets of proceedings and the bona fide attempt to have them heard together. Now, in making submissions about this, I'm not in any way inviting the court to really take account of anything other than findings that the judge actually made, because the judge made some detailed findings about this, <coughs> particularly in paragraphs 49 and 50, which we'll look at in detail at a moment, in a moment. But the position is basically this. These proceedings were started as soon as they reasonably could be. We took the assignment on the 30th of September 2014. They were commenced by the end of October 2014. Sorry, what was the date of the assignment? Uh, 30th of September 2014, my lord. It's quite a complicated funding agreement. We don't need to go into that, but it included and the, the assignment. Of and the proceedings were, that were issued before the end of October. They weren't 
Effort servant a little later. Efforts of a sort of pre-action process were pursued unsuccessfully. Uh, and as my lords have heard, in May, particulars of claim were served. When, when were the proceedings against the directors commenced? Well, they were commenced in <coughs> May 2014. They were commenced not by BTI, because they were commenced, uh, they were commenced by the then board of the company itself. Mm. The history is long and painful. They, they had to be harangued by BAT, basically, to persuade them to start these proceedings. They eventually did in May 2014. So they were already up and running, and they were also the subject of the assignment. So BTI took an assignment in relation to the claim against the directors and Sequana of a claim that was up and running. Assigned at the same time? At the same time. Yeah. So BTI had the problem that it was taking over proceedings that were already up and running, and it had assigned to it all sorts of other claims, <coughs> including this one, which it would have to investigate, get its head round, and then pursue or not. Mm. And it, no one suggested that BTI didn't act as quickly as it reasonably could. And the judge actually, uh, at paragraphs 18 and 38 of the judgment, describes the proceedings as having been issued promptly, as indeed they were. But having failed to avoid having to pursue the proceedings with the pre-action process, and having identified particulars of claim in May, BTI had the problem that it would seem to make sense to try to have the two things heard together. And so, again, expeditiously, in June, very soon after the particular claim was served, that application was issued. There was some pre-application pre correspondence between the solicitors. Uh, BTI lost patience with that and issued the application because clearly it had to be resolved. That was June 2015? Well, yes, exactly. By which time the date in the other proceeding, the trial date, had been fixed? Yes. Mm. So when, when, when did that happen? It happened in November 2014, which right. was after these proceedings had the claim form had been issued in the present proceedings, yeah. but before it had been served. Right, so November 2015, uh, sorry, November 2014, the, the, uh, the trial, the claim against the directors was fixed. Yes. Yeah. yes. And it was, it was rather bizarre, it was one of those occasions where the defendants seemed very keen to get the trial on. Um, but if, if, the, mm. if the proceedings against PwC had been served at that time, you said they were issued at the end of October. Yes. If they'd been served straight away, with a view to getting or ensuring that they were tried together, that could have been achieved. Well, the, the claim form was issued <coughs> at that point partly to guard against the limitation problem. Understood. Uh, and so it would have been impossible to actually plead any sort of claim at that point. Um, and, and it made sense, clearly, to try to go through some sort of pre-action process with PwC. To well, I'm just thinking aloud, yeah. really, Mr. Thompson, that it, you know, one of the problems that you face when you get to the hearing before Mr. Justice Mann is it inevitably the, the, def the individual defendants were resistant to losing their trial date because, it, because of the, the professional impact, professional and personal impact the proceedings mm -hmm. had on them. But if it, that had all happened perhaps five or six months earlier, um, the, then it, it, it might have been possible for this all to be dovetailed into one trial in the beginning of 2016. Well, it might have been. One would still have had to deal with Malone and Friends' application for PwC to strike out. Well, I'll come back to that in a second. Mm. Uh, it would also, more significantly, really have been impossible for BTI to achieve it. It moved very, very quickly. Remember, of course, it, it was in a position of having no documents at all in relation to this. It was entitled under the assignment, the funding agreement, to have documentation. As Mr. Lloyd's uh, evidence describes, it didn't actually get it all until May 2015, over provided in, in tranches. Uh, and it was in the position, really, rather like a liquidator's claim, because it didn't have any 
witnesses who are able to guide it, provide evidence. It didn't have the documents, although it was getting them. So it really wasn't feasible for BDI to actually get into a position to pursue the proceedings at a time which would have allowed all the defendants to be happy with their various problems with a trial starting at the beginning of mm. 2016. <clears throat> the, the fixing of the trial date in November 2014, was, was there a, a CMC? Was that fixed at a CMC? I think it was eventually all agreed on paper, though I'd have to check. You haven't got, the, you haven't got that order, I don't think. The chronology in the bundle simply says Deputy Master Cousins ordered that the Fort yes. three claim, etc., yeah. be heard over four to five weeks starting in February 2016. doesn't say whether by consent or not, but I mean, very often these things are done. Yes. Obviously by consent. And, um, mm. and at that point, as I say, P the PWC claim was merely an issued claim form which hadn't been served. Yes. Uh, and yeah. issued very much on a protected basis. Mm. Less than a month after the assignment. So there really wasn't anything, and no one suggested the contrary at any point, but I emphasise there really wasn't anything that BTI could have done to move any more quickly mm. to get to a point where these two uh, claims could be heard together without having to override some of the concerns of the defendants. So, so your point about why the um, particulars of claim were not served for seven months is that you were waiting for disclosure from, from the assignors? Well, yeah, we were waiting for provision of the documents which we were contractually entitled to under the assignment. We had to analyse that. We also did go through a sort of quasi pre action process with PwC, which yeah. included a mediation, <coughs> which we felt um, we would respectfully suggest be criticised. Yeah. Okay. Particularly as, in fact, uh, PwC were at that point BAT's auditors, so it was an additional sensitive to them. That didn't hold us up, but there were more reason to go through a mediation. Now, as I said, we reached a point in June uh, 2015 where we come to the view that the right thing to do is to try to get these two matters heard together. So we make the application. We are faced, as my lords know, with objections on different grounds yes. from all defendants. And the application was supported by, sorry, a British witness statement, was it? It was, or, I mean, is it one we've got in the bundles that we need? I to don't look? think it is, no, it's not, not one. I was really just wondering what, were the, the, what were the points at the time that were really being put forward as, well, the, as the, the, the strongest reasons for your plan to seek mm. consolidation? Well, in fact, I, I apologize if I'm wrong. I think, I think the evidence is in the bundle if one can, at least the skeleton arguments are. Yeah. Oh, yes, that's right. It's got an argument, yes. which are tabs 31, 32. Thank you. Well, that, that should, should show. 33. Yes. Well, 31 is your skeleton, isn't it? That's yes. yes. But, yeah. but there's helpfully, in, in the judgment of Mr. Justice Fancourt, a, a, a neat summary of the position. And importantly, we, at this point, are expressly making the point that there is a danger of irreconcilable mm. findings if these two proceedings are not heard together. So we accept there's going to overlap and we, we put that danger forward. And the important point about that danger that we're putting forward is that is, although we didn't spell it out, likely to happen in exactly these circumstances. Because <coughs> if we win, if, if they're heard separately, so we don't get our way, we don't have a joint trial. If we win against Sequana and the directors, subject to recovery, we're not especially likely to go on and sue PwC. To the extent we've recovered our loss, we can't. So for example, if we succeed in relation to the second dividend and we get paid by Sequana, well, we simply can't sue PwC in relation to that. It's not a matter of choice, we can't do it. The loss has been eradicated. So it's actually likely that there will be, if one goes back to June 2015, <coughs> that there will be irreconcilable findings if we lose against mm. the Quran and the directors, and then we go on and sue PwC. 
So we haven't spelled it out, but actually that, that's, the, that's the concern we're identifying. Now, for what it's worth, Sequana's reaction, as recorded by the judges, well, we, we the PTI, won't suffer if, in fact, there are two trials. Obviously completely <coughs> wrong if, if we're going to be faced with an abuse argument in relation to the second trial. <coughs> And as my learned friends explained, the PwC's position was, well, we don't want a, uh, a joint trial if it's got to be in early 2016. It'll have to be a, a great deal later because we want to pursue a strike out. Hmm. Uh, hmm. But one way or another, we've, we are faced with all the defendants objecting. Now, no one has taken issue with or challenged the findings of Mr. Justice Fancourt in relation to this, which are particularly set out in paragraphs 49 and 50 of the judgment. If I could invite my lords just to, to look at that. Just tab 7. <coughs> the section starts back at paragraph 38, where... Yeah, it's 38 through 50 that he deals with the what you mm. call the case management. Well, Lord, absolutely, point. thank you, yes. And, and 49 it, and 50 are his summary. Where 49, he says, both sides are reading too much into the disposal of the joint trial. It, it, absolutely. Now, what, what he does say, if I can just identify, I think my Lord's have been, been shown in passing these paragraphs, the points that we extract from them. Well, the first is that the joint trial application was properly made. Second, there were good reasons for a single trial, all other things being equal. However, third, they weren't. There was potential unfairness to both Sequana and the directors and also PwC in the form of delay and the strikeout application point respectively. As regards the merits of the application, Mr. Justice Vancourt found that they were finely balanced, and there was, as he put it, every prospect that it would have failed if we carried on with it. By well, that, he missed the application for a joint trial. Yes, exactly. I don't get that. <coughs> if they were finely balanced, how could it be every prospect that they'd fail? Well, I understand that point. I, I suspect what he means by every prospect is... I, speaking for myself, um, uh, you have a defendant who wants a trial, and you have another defendant who doesn't want a trial, uh, uh, and you have... Um, or at least not the trial that's said, and you have, it's clearly been raised that there are inconsistent findings. Um, right. the, the, I, I can understand why it's finely balanced full stop. Um, I'm about to say, I, I, I don't know where that comes from, to say that there was every chance that it would have failed. Well, uh, as a case manager, I don't get that, I think. I think maybe it's just a question of choice of language. I mean, yes. every prospect doesn't necessarily mean a probability. It just, it's, no, it's, it's, it's I, on the cards. It's a I, real possibility. I think you were it's a real possibility, yeah. as was that it was successful. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. But as to the outcome, we accepted that one can't treat the dismissal by consent as the same as dismissal after a fight, which, of course, we accept. <coughs> Uh, but he did describe the dismissal by agreement as a convenient means <coughs> of dealing with the issue. And very importantly, at paragraph 50, he held that BTI did not act unreasonably in not pursuing the application further. And I would, this is me adding a gloss on that here rather than the judge's finding, but I, I would add that BTI couldn't here be in a better position other than by having actually rejected any compromise and just carried on and fought the application uh, and lost it. But BTI shouldn't in our submission be penalised for compromising. The courts and courts encourage compromise, including on case management matters. And the judge held that was entirely reasonable. I mean, a compromise of that nature, anyway, it's one that has, requires the court's blessing because it is a matter that involves the court as well. It's not as though the court is functus officio the moment the parties have presented a consent order to them. My Lord, absolutely. And, and on that, Mr. Justice Fancourt's findings at paragraph 50 were that um, 
if the agreed course had been inappropriate, Mr Justice Mann would, in his words, no doubt, have resisted it. Yeah. And this, this is clearly right in our submission, because Mr Justice Mann was mildly annoyed at having had a day's full day's he was, preview, yes. <laughs> and only being told early on the morning that actually the parties had done a deal late the night before. So he read all the papers, <coughs> an hour's hearing, which was, I accept, largely about what to do with the, the uh, PwC strikeout application. But it's clearly right that, as the judge put it, it can be properly inferred that there was nothing inherently wrong with the prospect of two trials. It certainly wasn't implicit in the consent order that if our claim against Sequoia and the directors failed, it would be an abuse to go on and pursue PwC. Because, as the judge pointed out, in that case, what should have happened would have been not directions for a defence when PwC's strike at application was concluded, but instead some sort of stay. But of course, that, if I understand that, the point about it not necessarily being a, an abuse to have two trials, that, that has to be, at that time, has to be measured at what the claim was at that time. Because the claims now are different. Well, uh, well Lord, they are, yes. We have, we have so, amended them. But so bo both, in that sense, both parties' positions now are different to what they were in 2015 in front of Mr Justice Mann because the claims were different. The, the claims were different, but insofar as the complaint now made by PwC is directed at overlap between the claims, that overlap was basically pretty much there in June. Overlap as a general... There's an overlap. Yes, I'm, I'm a general <coughs> statement. Yes, yeah, I get, I get it, it, because that's what that's what the, the judge refers to Mr. Lloyd's evidence: the risk of inconsistent yes, findings yes, and exactly. ultimately so, inconsistent. I mean, judgment. that is what prompted the application in the first place, largely on the basis of what you've told us. And yes, indeed. Yes, and, and but my, my point part of the attack on the auditors was that the accounts didn't show, didn't have show a true and fair view of the financial status of the company. Yes, and and I, therefore I, the dividends the that were, were unlawful, yes. which was the same point as was being made <coughs> in the proceedings against the directors, and yeah. that's where the substantial overlap always led. Absolutely. <coughs> and I, I'm going to go on and explain where the overlap is now, because we say it's really rather different to the picture uh, painted by Melania Friend. I'm not going to do that now. But, but just in terms of uh, my Lord Lord Justice Coulson's point, if anything, the original particulars would have had relatively proportionately more overlap and fewer points that we now say are entirely <coughs> different to those resolved in the first proceedings. But certainly everything that's now... Well, the risk, of, in, uh, risk of giving ourselves even more homework. <laughs> it, it might be helpful if we had a copy of the original. Certainly, we'll, we'll make sure we get that. Um, yes. it, it's slightly difficult to... Mm. to understand why PwC thought that they had a, a chance at that stage of strike out without having seen what the pleadings said. Well, yes, and, and, and <coughs> my old friend gave my lords his take on, on their strike out application um, without the benefit of uh, showing the, the court anything, if I may repulse with mine. Um, he tended to suggest that, well, the whole thing was flawed and they applied to strike it out and we saved the day by the amendments. Uh, true, a lot of the amendments dealt with points that were being made in the strike out, but rather more in terms of, well, this is a, this is a silly point, let's just knock it on the head by dealing with it, by amending. So uh, we certainly don't see the strike application in the way that it was portrayed. I'm not sure anything turns on that, but I just wanted to make that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, we would actually say that rather than it being implicit in the consent order that we could pursue PwC later. I, if anything, it's implicit that we could, because the whole basis of the application, as I've mentioned, is the risk of inconsistent findings, which were, as I've explained, more likely to eventuate if we lost the proceedings against the coroner and the directors. And no one, none of the defendants, PwC included, popped up 
up in response to that evidence and said, oh no, there's no real danger of inconsistent findings because you won't be able to do this. Mm. You're, you're, you're tilting at a windmill here. There isn't really a problem. In fact, the yes, it would indeed be quite a trap if, if without it having been made explicit, you would end it up being caught in the abuse of process trap, so to speak, merely by virtue of entering into an agreement which was on any view by any balance and where there were arguments both ways. Yes, and we, we, we were making it clear that our concern was the risk of inconsistent findings in exactly this sort of situation. Right. Yeah. And PwC didn't come back and, and make the point that they wanted to even reserve their position as regards being able to apply to strike us out on grounds of abuse if they got sued later. Mm. Now, I'm not, I'm not accusing them of doing anything improper, no. but if one looks at the Aldi test of putting one's yeah. cards on the mm. table, they didn't do it. We I mean, did. The, pro the, prob the problem mm. is that um, because, it ne because it was never argued out in front of Mr. Justice Mann, one, one doesn't know whether uh, PwC would in fact have raised the point about you know, uh, inconsistent findings, not appropriate to have two trials. Uh, because the uh, inconsistent findings, collateral attack on findings made, etc., etc., uh, and the judge would then have had to <coughs> make his mind up as to what the right case management order to make in those circumstances was. And one such order would have been, given that Sequana were resisting um, adjournment, would have been to say, well, in a sense, the lesser of two evils was it to be two consecutive trials. Yes, that, that, that's that's absolutely fair. And well, and you know, thinking thinking about it, unlikely for the judge to have put you to your election at that stage mm. in some way. It, it's impossible to tell what what could have happened. Because if he tried to put you to your election and said, well, you better you can't pursue the second set of proceedings if the first set of proceedings uh, it fails, you'd have been bound to say, well, the only fair result is therefore to give us a consolidated trial. Exactly. And we, exactly. If, we, if, anyone, <coughs> if anyone had popped up at that point and said yeah, what's that's now true. being said by PwC, any suggestion that we would not be prejudiced yeah. by not having a single trial mm. would have disappeared. There'd be no fine balancing anymore. It would be absolutely clear that there had to be mm. a single trial, because otherwise we would be terribly prejudiced, far more suffering far more prejudice than PwC were alluding to, or indeed yeah. Sequan and the directors, mm -hmm. but no one did. And, and uh, as I say, if, any, if one can infer anything from the consent order by implication, it's that we should be allowed to do exactly what we're doing, <coughs> because we've raised the danger of inconsistent findings, and the other parties said essentially, well, no, that's not a problem. The judge agreed with that by making the consent order, and no one raised the point. And do you yeah. say that, Mr. Thompson, so I understand it, um, do you say that even if it is otherwise an abusive collateral attack, well, do you say you should still be allowed to go on because of the circumstances in which it all happened in the first place? Well, yes, we, it, putting it very shortly, my lord, yes, we do. But it, it's it's... It's a well, I appreciate issue. you don't say it is a, no. an abuse. I'm just trying to get, I'm, I'm really just trying to weigh the importance <coughs> of the case management point. And so on your submission, it is important. It is very important, yeah. absolutely. I mean, it, it is determinative. We, we, we suggest that it, it does merit greater weight than the judge appears to have given it. Because it does mean that if, but we don't accept this, but if this might otherwise be an abuse, by virtue of the case management history, it clearly can't be. It cannot be bringing the administration of justice into disrepute for this claim to be pursued in circumstances where we tried to have a joint trial. And where it was a difficult question and a question of case management for the court. Yes. Um, yes, and that's the force of that. Mm. And hindsight's a wonderful thing. And in, yes. the, in the Oceana's case, it, but a couple of a couple of points, it's noted, I'll, I'll, I'll stop, I mean, just made this point, that, of course, and this is Lord Justice Carr uh, notes that it might well be with hindsight that one wishes there had been consolidation. This is page 135, column 2. And, and also similar sentiments at 138, column 2. 
that it's highly undesirable to have two trials. But the point is that if that has to happen, it is not in these circumstances abusive. Mm. It's undesirable with hindsight one wishes it weren't happening, but it's not an abusive process. Well, it was the kind of least worst solution to a difficult problem, but yes. um, that's not the kind of situation in which you should be ruled out of court altogether. Absolutely, and if, if of course, things had gone differently at the trial in February 2016, it might have seemed a, a, a fantastically sensible solution. Mm. As if we'd simply won, recovered our money, never troubled PwC, then that would be that. Mm. Well, that Is that a good moment? Yeah, you the point. <laughs> Can I just confirm, you do all still wish us to start a quarter of an hour early at 10.15 tomorrow? Or, I mean, we're willing to do so if you, I think, unless there's any change in position. It would probably be sensible if my lords don't mind, just to make sure that, if anything, we have... It's not an encouragement to take up every minute of the time. No, no, I, 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 <laughs> don't worry, I, would, I won't say anything more than I feel I have to. <laughs> it, it's my fault. I have a, a meeting tomorrow at 4.30, which... I, I, I will need about 10 minutes to stop about 10 minutes before yep. in order to be ready. So it, it's my fault. There's nothing I can do about it. We're, we're most grateful to the court for, for sitting around. Well, in that case, thank you all very much. We will um, sit again at 10.15 in the morning in that case. Thank you.